spark. So, uh, rounding out the panel will be my paper uh, <coughs> entitled Distrust of Art, Imagining a Polyphonic Common in Peter Carey's Jack Max. Uh, taking somewhat of a different track than the, than the first two panelists, I think. Um, the, well, I'll, I'll mention real quickly, I'm a fifth year doctoral student at WVU. Um, this paper itself is not coming out of a larger project, but a lot of the ideas that I'm developing here about the role of adaptation and a common are getting incorporated into my dissertation, uh, which is actually about contemporary British and Anglophone drama. Uh, so, novels are not normally what I write about. Uh, so again, the, the paper is entitled Distrustful Art, Imagining a Polyphonic Common in Peter Carey's Jack Mags. Postmodern authors who adapt or appropriate canonical literary texts simultaneously critique and preserve their narrative pre uh, and preserve their predecessors through narrative dissonance. The competition of narratives and voices offering different perspectives within the same literary space. Peter Carey's 1997 novel, Jack Maggs, confronts colonial and classist ideologies at work in Charles Dickens's Great Expectations by giving a previously silenced character his own voice. Carey's presentation of the transported convict, Abel Magwitch, who gets renamed Jack Maggs in the novel, uh, reimagines this marginalized character as possessing his own complex history, experiences, and opinions. Giving Mags his own writing voice puts heteroglossic play at the center of Carey's adaptation, putting the latter novel in conversation with his 19th century predecessor. Presenting the metafictional author Tobias Oates's novel alongside Mags's description of his own history parallels Carey's revisions to Dickens' original portrait of Mag, which, would have, which had been narrated by Pip. Now this is a little bit confusing if you haven't read Carey's novel, so we've got this sort of constellation of writers around this character of Magwitch slash Mags. So we have Dickens, who writes Great Expectations, and Pip, who narrates Great Expectations. Then we have Carey, who writes Jack Mags, and his two author figures are Jack Mags, who writes autobiographically, and Tobias Oates, who writes a very fictionalized biography. So that constellation hopefully is going to make this a little clearer because there's a lot of dichotomies that I talk about. Um, however, as Carey's text destabilizes narrative's ability to establish knowledge, it also undermines the authority of his writing, prompting the reader to question not only Dickens and Oates, but Carey and Mags as well. Um, incidentally, and I'll talk about this more, Oates is a sort of Charles Dickens figure in the novel. Um, I argue that this cacophony of voices can lead to a critique of late capitalism if we read the process of adaptation itself as engaging in a literary and polyphonic common. So what do I mean by this? Well, in conceptualizing adaptation as a shared or common mode of writing resistant to late capitalism, I'm picking up from the work of Michael Hart and Antonio Negri in their excellent book, Commonwealth, which I recommend you all read if you haven't already, uh, where they theorize the common as an alternative social organization to neoliberalism's individualist and consumerist ethos. For Hart and Negri, the common is centered on shared cultural performances, artifacts, codes, languages, ideas, and so on, which are held as the collective cultural heritage of particular peoples and by extension of a global commonwealth. They ground the production of a cultural commonwealth in felicitous encounters, writing that this shared cultural production requires first an openness to alterity and the capacity to form relationships with others, to generate joyful encounters and thus create social bodies with ever greater capacities. Now as I see it, Peter Carey's novel relies on the polyphonic nature of adaptation to facilitate these kinds of encounters. Through its postmodern destabilization of narrative voice, Carey enters into playful conversation with Dickens and with the characters of both novels, Great Expectations and Jack Maggs. 
Through this narrative technique, Carrie exposes great expectations as a text thoroughly grounded within its own cultural precepts, particularly imperialism. And Carrie's an Australian author, so that imperialism has particular relevance for him uh, rewriting the position of a transported convict who was sent to Van Diemen's land. Carrie takes a relatively minor character from a, a canonical work, in this case Abel Magwitch, and develops him as a character capable of and interested in telling his own story. The characters Carrie creates are slightly different from those in Dickens, as Magwitch becomes Mags and Pip becomes Henry Phipps, Phipps for instance. Um, and despite these, I would say, minor changes, uh, Carrie's novel clearly takes its cue from Dickens' earlier work and in the process of adaptation comes into contact and dissonance with great expectations. Now this contact between the two novels or authors draws attention to the heteroglossic nature of both works. We'll remember Bakhtin defines heteroglossia as a diversity of social speech types, sometimes even diversity of languages, and a diversity of individual voices artistically organized. So in other words, heteroglossia consists of various speech patterns and types of enunciation structured together to create an ostensibly whole text. Bakhtin argues that this is, the, this is fundamental to the novel as a literary form, but what I argue here is that in drawing our attention to the heteroglossic function of adaptation, Carey makes this play of voices thematically central to Jack Maggs in a way it's not overtly central to Great Expectations. Every time the story of Mags or Magwitch is told, whether by Dickens, Carey, Pip, Mags, or Oates, the distinct tellings render the character through the author's own cultural lens. So for instance, Dickens' presentation of Magwitch is colored by his ideological positioning in an imperial and classist society, along with a Victorian faith in human nature. Uh, so Dickens slash Pip writes of Magwitch that to my thinking, there was something in him that made it hopeless to attempt to disguise him. The more I dressed him, the better I dressed him, the more he looked like the slouching fugitive on the marshes. So Dickens understands Magwitch as inherently criminal. But while Carrie's Jack Mags has some trouble hiding the marks of his criminality, the latter character is very different from Magwitch. And perhaps the most distinct difference is Mags's command of language, particularly written language. Mags writes his own story, and he writes that story in the fluid manner characteristic of an educated and experienced author. Over several chapters in uh, Carey's novel, Mags composes a lengthy letter presenting his history to Henry Phipps. Mags's writing style is much more sophisticated and polished than that of Tobias Oates, the professional author who stands in for Dickens. Not only the style of writing, but the technique of Mags's writing demonstrates his skillfulness. As Mag write, Mags writes from left to right, no, from right to left, sorry, rather than left to right, feels weird to reverse that. Um, Mags writes from right to left rather than from left to right, and he writes in disappearing ink. Carey tells us that Mags wrote fluidly, as if long accustomed to that distrustful art, and Parenthetically, I think the phrase distrustful art here is really important when we're talking about uh, writing because throughout this narrative we have the sort of interplay of voices undermining the authority of any written narrative. Uh, close parentheses. Uh, the fluidity of Mags's backward disappearing writing suggests the level of skill he brings to his own story Unlike Magwitch, whose history and great expectations is narrated entirely through Pip's reflective first person and who, therefore, can never escape being merely that slouching fugitive. Of course, Pip is a complicating factor in great expectations, because along with the authorial pairing of Oates and Mags and Dickens and Carey, this, uh, this analysis must also account for the Dickens and Pip dichotomy because this is the initial heteroglossic instability of great expectations itself. There's an incongruity of voices in any text with a narrative persona, that is, with a division between writer and narrator. In the light of Jack Maggs, which draws attention to the role of ideology in providing a framework for narratives, 
we must wonder who authors great expectations, whose ideology and prejudices shape the presentation of Magwitch, to what extent does Dickens write, to what extent does Pip write, but given the limitations of this presentation uh, and the fact that I'm not a Dickens scholar, let it suffice that the instability of Pip and Dickens as distinct and yet simultaneous writers of great expectations is reproduced in the more complicated form of the carry as mags and carry as oats dichotomies in different sections of Jack Mags. Now the most common narrative persona in Jack Mags, other than sort of third person, is that of Mags himself. His letter links him to Dickens because Mags' Mags's writing style mirrors the best of Dickens' prose with flowing descriptions of places and evocative images of an impoverished London, even borrowing Dickensian tropes. Julie Sanders notes that the thieving community in which Mags finds himself placed as a child is a version of Fagin's factory of child thieves in Oliver Twist. The images evoke Dickens' work and capitalizes on their cultural currency. And because of Mags' writing skill, both his sophisticated prose style and the, complex, uh, and the complexity of his backward writing, our initial impulse is to believe that his autobiographical letter is trustworthy. However, because Mags' letter is itself a reproduction or adaptation of specific cultural tropes found throughout Dickens' canon, the texture of his story calls into question the very possibility of authentic narratives. And this difficulty becomes more pronounced as Tobias Oates begins writing his novel about Mags, and the narrative dissonance of the Carrie Dickens dichotomy is reproduced in the narrative dissonance of a Mags Oates dichotomy. If Mags's writing reproduces the best elements of Dickens's prose, Oates's writing reproduces the worst of Dickens's style. An excessive devotion to details and environmental description coupled with vague philosophical or metaphysical pretensions. We read the metafictional first chapter of Oates's novel, The Death of Mags, who, by the way, is still alive at the time of writing, which gives us a sense of Oates's style. He devotes these paragraphs to details about the interaction of the yellow fog and the Welsh bluestone of Newgate Prison. Unlike Mags, whose description flows smoothly into the action of his characters, Oates's settings try to do their own metaphysical work. Also, like Dickens, Oates's writing is character-driven, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Carey informs us, Toby had always had, had a great affection for characters. Dustmen, jugglers, costers, pickpockets. He thought nothing of engaging the most gruesome types in Shepherd Market and writing down their histories in his chapbook. Now, like Mags's letter, Oates's writing is shaped by Dickens's style and content, further blurring the lines between various authors. Additionally, because Carey has actually written the words of both Oates and Mags, it becomes challenging to distinguish Carey's writing from the other three authors. Sanders writes, labels such as the convict or the writer become treacherously unstable in the course of Jack Mags, where, increasingly, they have the potential to apply to either Mags or Oates. And additionally, I would add that the, the label the writer applies equally well to Dickens and Carey, or with equal uncertainty. This instability of authorship produces dissonance as it becomes progressively more difficult to identify the narrative voice of different sections of the novel. Voices blend together, losing their distinctiveness, and we as readers are asked to interrogate the very potential of the author as such. It may seem that we have four narrators all describing the same character, that is, Mags or Magwitch, in distinctly different ways. But each version is structured by the same set of cultural tropes, obscuring which voice belongs to which author. The role of cultural tropes in shaping competing narratives of Mags or Magwitch undermines the illusion of a unified character which a single narrator's description, and I would say particularly a first or third person narrator, allows us to imagine. When a character is described as a consistent whole by a single narrator, readers are allowed the comfortable illusion that we know, or that we can know, the truth of a character. However, 
heteroglossic descriptions of the character from multiple perspectives destabilize this illusory unity and call into question our ability to understand any character apart from the speci specific perspective through which that character is immediately presented. The implications of this playful instability of voices and narrative viewpoints interests me in this presentation because heteroglossia is an inherent quality of adaptation. Focusing on the polyphonic texture of adaptation provides a potential model for an aesthetic common. As Linda Hutchins says, adaptations are inherently palimpsestuous works, haunted at all times by their adapted texts. If we know that prior text, we always feel its presence shadowing the one we are experiencing directly. In other words, the process of adaptation is inherently conversational. Uh, sorry, lost my place. Uh, as, as the adaptation speaks back to the adapted text. This suggests the kind of felicitous encounter that Hart and Negri identify as the basis for a commonwealth culture, the dialectic development of ideas, languages, codes, and shared experience. And this is incidentally part of the reason why Hart and Negri occur opposed current rigid standards of copyright. They feel that shared culture can best be advanced through the open exchange, interplay, and development of ideas. This is, of course, opposed to the existing capitalist system used to establish individual, usually corporate, ownership of ideas in the pursuit of profit. On this point, Hart and Negri write, if you use that idea productively, I can use it too at the very same time. In fact, the more of us that work on an idea and communicate about it, the more productive it becomes. Because adaptation inherently involves working with and developing ideas, particularly ideas that already carry substantial intellectual or cultural currency, thinking of adaptation as a process inherently confronting the ethos of ownership in late capitalist neoliberalism allows us to situate our resistance within the texture of postmodern aesthetics. Thank you.